One thing that used to annoy me when I would uh, get to church was we'll just start and we'll say, okay, everybody start praying. My problem with it was I felt we were praying very randomly. I felt like we were just pray. Prayer, prayer about what? There was no context to the prayer. You know what I mean? Now, before we started recording, I'll just clarify. I asked, when we speak in tongues, who are we addressing? And we all agreed that we're speaking to God. And I said that there are tongues of men and there are tongues of angels. Jay brought out that response. I would have you know, as we pray for the next few minutes, you are speaking to angels. Remember, you're committing everything in your life, everything that you work on, into God's hands. I want you to be conscious that you are speaking to spirits. The Bible says that these ministering spirits, they go before us to minister on our behalf. Sometimes we pray, we say, Lord, make the crooked path straight. God operates by words and spirits carry out the action. God says, let there be light. But we don't see that it is God Almighty necessarily moving upon the face of the waters. Now, that could be controversial, but let me explain that. He says, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God spoke, let there be light or light be, and there was light. The point I'm trying to raise is that words go forth, and that's the tongues that you are speaking, and it speaks to angels who go and execute that thing. So you may be praying about your future. You don't know what parts of your future you need to cover, but angels are going ahead of you. So in these next few moments that we are praying, I want you to pray with a consciousness that you are speaking to angels. The Bible talks of a woman in Revelation who was giving birth, and Satan released a demon to go after that child that she gave birth to. That's how it works in the spiritual realm. When every child is born, there are demons assigned to destroy that child's life, and there are also angels assigned to help that child's life. So God has a deposit, a reservoir, or assigned angels for you. You've heard some people talk about my guardian angel. Have you heard of that you know, term before? So you have angels. So just as much as the devil is persistent in trying to destroy lives, God is persistent in trying to help lives. Now, I want you to speak in other tongues and be conscious that you are speaking to angels. You're speaking into your future, you know, and you're designing it. Another thing is that through this knowledge I'm giving you, that's how those things become possible. Those things become possible. The Bible says in the Old Testament that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. If we had a parcel, the reason I'm doing all this is to make your faith effective in what I'm saying. If I had a parcel and I gave it to you, it's as good as me saying I delivered it to you, right? The same way, the Bible says, you know, Amazon delivery, no? The Bible says that through knowledge, the just shall be delivered. Meaning that every time you know something, you are transported to another place. You are transported into that reality. He says the just shall be delivered. So as you know about it, it lit you, you literally can take advantage of it now because it's delivered you into that thing. Now I'm telling you, when you pray in tongues, don't pray blindly about your future. You think about your future. And as you pray like that, somebody explained that the power of God is controlled with your mind. He works through your mind. Your mind is capable of so much. You direct power, grace towards your future. To take care of things there. To take care of things there. You orchestrate favor. You're speaking grace. So I want us to pray now for the next few moments concerning our future. Everything that concerns us. From the jobs you will take up. The things you will set up. Your family. Pray concerning that future. You know, pray in other tongues. Let's continue to pray. Spirits. Ministering spirits that are there to take control, to help us, to prosper us, to perfect our way, to perfect our future. La cosa bracadele gista. Liman, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We thank you because our future is in your hands. You are our future. Thank you because everything we need in our future we have. Wisdom, knowledge, resources, people, money, whatever we need is taken care of. You are at work in us to will and to do, to inspire and to perform your good pleasure. Thank you because those who believe in you will never be put to shame. Thank you because we have joy in you. We have glory in you. 
There's beauty in you. Thank you because everything that we need is inside of you. We don't look to the world for help, for anything, but our trust is in you. Our hope is in you. We give you praise, Lord. We give you praise. Because we are edified even in this time, even in this hour, concerning your kingdom, concerning the world in which we live. Thank you because you continue to teach us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Distinguish us for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. You may be seated. Thank you. We have been on a series that has refused to close. The scripture tells us, and God affirmed to me when I woke up this morning, he said, those who believe in me will never be ashamed. And I contemplated it. Is those who believe in God would never be put to shame. You know what that means? It means you would never allow shame come to your life for believing in Him. And I, I want you to be conscious from today that there is a reward for hope and believing in God. Just believing. Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe in me. Blessed are those who have not yet seen me but still believe. So that is an inspiration to keep believing because there is a reward for believing. There is hope in believing. There's hope in believing. And that comforts me greatly. The Bible says that through hope and comfort of the scriptures, we obtain the promises. See? Comfort of the scriptures. Comfort of the scriptures. Comfort of the scriptures. So, Last time, we dealt with power to the fatigued. We talked about how even the strong rely on God. That everybody would fail. Anything can fail. But those who are one with God do not fail. They don't lose because they take up his strength. And they leave theirs. We're inspired differently. And I said that what makes this connection with God possible is prayer. Without this prayer, you would find that your connection to God, your relatability with his things, and importantly, your love for God would dim. That's why it's important to talk with him. To talk with him, not just in your dedicated times, but even as you go through. From time to time, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. I'm grateful to you. I had a friend, and interestingly, I am recently over the phone, but in our Year eight, this guy would pray like every five minutes. He was very scared of rapture or going to hell. So he used to pray like every five or ten minutes. The next thing you hear him, you just join prep. That's how you know he's praying. Just being, Lord, forgive me for any sins I've committed. <laughs> you know, and all these things. I need to do. Thank you, man. And then he'll continue life. He was praying every like five, ten minutes. I'm telling you. Such a holy fear. I think it, it's a very good uh, method. I'm telling you, you have to worry when the rapture happens and, oh, you need to pray. No, you've been praying every five minutes. Uh, the last five minutes should cover this many five minutes, you know. I want to briefly talk in this higher level praying and higher level answers. Some things on making heaven or the hope of seeing him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? It talks about the importance of, of the love of God. The first thing is to believe in God. Believe in God. But then a very important thing in seeing him at the end of the day is to have love for him. The love of God is important. The love of God is your inspiration to serve him. Your inspiration to believe in him even when Everyone else may back away from you. 
The love of God is what inspires in you to know about him, to read your Bible. So the first thing is to believe in God, which is the first qualification. And we have John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, should not go into damnation, but have everlasting life. So the first thing is to believe in him. The second thing is to pray. Pray. Why? Because prayer increases the love of God in you. I said here, it is your preservation and it is your guide. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. It says, And he came out and went, and as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray so that you don't enter into temptation. So you don't enter into temptation. And he, as he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, so Jesus was about a stone's throw away from them, he knelt down and prayed. So if Jesus was praying for preservation, that God should strengthen and help him to get through the tough thing he was going through, how much more do we need that? I've seen people that say, oh yeah, because it's Jesus, that's why it happened. But no, he served God as a man, as somebody who was not capable of being perfect see but he taught us the principles that would help us to serve God better and he prioritized prayer so I said here without prayer you'd fall easily you would give in easily if you aren't prayerful Matthew 26 verse 38 it says then said he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death he says, tarry here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. So he was desperate in this prayer, saying, Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but as you will. As you will. And he came and unto his disciples and found them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Don't you know that Jesus started the word trend? Verse 41 says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. It says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So prayer helps in that area. To enforce the will of your spirit over your flesh. And remember that in this series I told you about somebody I know that was struggling to lose weight. And God told me that if this person would take prayer seriously, they would be able to lose that weight. He says, the spirit is willing. And the spirit of us is usually the willing part of us. It's the part that wants to do good. It's the part that has a better desire for our lives. Our spirit doesn't want to see us in uh, an unhealthy state in any situation. But the flesh, the ways of the flesh is towards destruction. It wants to eat everything. It wants to take every, like it, it just, it's always tending towards destruction. That's why you can't be fleshly led. When you're fleshly led, you accept any kind of money. When you're spiritually led, you accept only God's blessing. What God has blessed. You see, you're conscious. You're conscious of only accepting that which he has planned for you. But when you're fleshly led, you see everything as benefit. Every money as benefit. Every, everything, every trade as benefit. You would not care what the cost of a dream or a thing is. Not all wisdom is good. There is divine wisdom. And there is fleshly wisdom. There's devilish wisdom. And the Bible talks about it. So he says, pray so that your spirit would be over your flesh in dealing with these things. I was talking to somebody. And I said, you need to remember that the fact that the Holy Spirit is with you means you can get answers right now. This idea that God is far, and so it will take two months 
before you get an answer to something you need right now. It's not what Christ died for. He died to give us a life of a closer connection with God. Jesus wasn't confused when they asked him questions. He knew God's will and emphasized that. So I said, if you don't pray, you'd sleep. You'd lose yourself. You'd, you won't be aware of spiritual things. You wouldn't recognize times and seasons. I said, you'd live like a regular youth. Of the world, instead of living born of God and representing him effectively on earth. These things are important. I said here, yeah, you'd have hardness of heart. Do you, do you know what hardness of heart is? Now, I'm looking forward to, you know, like talking more on these things. But like I said, after this, I'll move to more conference and special type programs that we'll have once in a while in life, you know. Hardness of heart is a very dangerous thing. Hardness of heart is what causes you to be ungrateful. Hardness of heart can bring out greater depths of ungratefulness. Where God is doing things in your life and you are just too blind to see them. Hardness of heart causes you to repeat the mistakes that you've made before. Hardness of heart is not a concept developed by Dikana. Jesus talked about it. He says because their hearts were hardened, they did not understand that he had just multiplied bread for them. And yet they think he's still talking about bread. Yet he was talking about doctrine. Hardness of heart makes you unaware of spiritual things. You want to know what destroys your discernment? Hardness of heart. Hardness of heart causes that God is trying to speak to you. But you don't even recognize. Even when he uses an obvious human being, you can't even recognize God is speaking to you. Hardness of heart is what has that a lot of people are very prideful. So prideful they won't get saved. You know? They would see God. God is alive, very much alive and real. But they will still say, no, this is not your life. Hardness of heart. So I said, you would have hardness of heart and you won't be able to discern our right. Your love for him would be up and down, dim and bright. You prove you love him when you do his word. And prayer would help that. In John 14, I want you to see that. John 14, verse 15. Scripture teaches us something. The scripture says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It means do my commandments. Do, do the things that I say you should do. Let's look at that same, in that same John, John chapter 21, verse 14. The first one was John chapter 14, verse 15. This other one is John 21, from 14 to 17. It says, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said unto him, Yeah, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. You know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. That was his commandment. So as Christians, if we love God, we'll teach his word. Feed my lambs, meaning teach my instruction. Teach my children. Feed my children. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said unto him, Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He repeated it again. Look at the things, be mindful of things he repeats because he's trying to drive home a message. Verse 17, he said unto him a third time. And this was significant because he had, while he was still alive, he asked him all these things. You know, he said, You deny. And, and Peter said, No, I would not. He said, by the time the cock crows, you'd have denied me three times. So, it's God's love language when you do the things that he wants you to do. You go after his dream, what he wants for you. So life is not just any way that you want to do it. It's in his love language. Now, Remember, I was giving you points about making heaven right. The first was to believe. The second was to pray, and I, and I was giving you the benefits of that. Okay? And just before I get to the third, I want to show you something in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, 
Being set free by believing in God, that's what that means. We have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace. We have peace with God. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace wherein we stand. He says we stand in the grace of God right now. Meaning you're on the favored side of God right now. You're on the favored side of God right now. And rejoice. You know, people, people shouldn't live a life where you want to do something good so that, you know, God feels qualified to bless you. Or you feel uh, qualified for God to bless you now. So maybe you want to ask something big from God. So you calculate it in yourself. Imagine the God that can see your heart, your, your dream calculation. You say, okay, I'll do good for like two days. I'll, I'll specially help and I'll specially clean. And I'll, then you now ask. You know, I, I, I once, uh, I don't want to uh, reveal the person directly, but they were talking about how they wished for a kind of relationship that God had with a man of God that was talking. Where God would just ask the man of God, say what you want right now, I'll do it. You know, something like what God had with Solomon. Ask what you will right now, I'll do it. And I was like, and you know, she was like, oh, if I could just have that kind of relationship with, with uh, God. So many things we say out of ignorance. We don't know what ignorance. But he says we stand in the grace of God right now. Meaning we stand on the favored side of God. Meaning God is willing to do stuff for us right now. We don't need to do something to earn a position where we can ask. Us believing in Jesus Christ is the favored position. Hmm. So he says, and not only so, that's verse 3, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. And he says, and patience, experience, and experience hope. You know, you could have a sermon of this. Experience hope. And hope does not make a shame. I love this verse. You probably heard me say it a lot. Hope does not make a shame. Anytime somebody, I see somebody hoping, or I say, hope doesn't make a shame. There's nothing wrong. There's no shame in hoping. There's, there's nothing wrong with hoping. Be careful with pessimistic people. They make you doubt hoping. They make hoping look like a bad thing. Be hopeful. Always be hopeful. It says, hope does not make a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. This is important because he's saying, in verse 2, he says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He says, we hope to see the glory of God. How many will hope? We hope to see God's face. We hope to see Jesus eventually. So he says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, hoping that we'll see him. And verse 5 says, and hope does not make a shame because the love of God, he says, is what is going to be the key. So you can read from verse 2 into verse 5 to make sense. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And this hope does not make us ashamed because... Because something is going to ensure that we see the glory of God. He says, it's the love of God. But not just any kind of love of God. He says, the love of God which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He says that there is a love that the Holy Spirit inspires in us that can ensure that we would make it to see the glory of God, to see the face of Jesus. You see? The love of God. So how do we get this love that the Holy Ghost gives, that he sheds in our heart for, for God? How do we ensure that that love is there? Jude chapter 1, verse 18, shows us just how. Let me say from verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ? How that they told you that there should be mockers. There are people that are going to mock God in the last time. Who would walk after their own ungodly lusts. He says, these be they who separate themselves. He says, they, they always make a division. They separate themselves. They are sensual, he says. They only work with the senses. Their flesh. Having not the spirit. He says they don't have the Holy Spirit. He says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, instead of being sensual. Why? We walk by faith and not by sight. So he says, instead of being sensual, only working by your senses, what you think is going to work out for you. He says, Build up on your most holy faith. It means set yourself up on the side of faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He now says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I want you to see that Jude chapter 1 verse 21 is connected with Romans chapter 5. 
where it talks about us seeing the glory of God. He says, speak in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost so that you can keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy. Remember Jesus said to watch and pray, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And he says, on some that are making a difference, have compassion on them. Those that are separating themselves, have compassion on them, making a difference. Have you seen some, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, and I'm, I'm okay going to hell. He says, these are the ones, they are making a difference, they're going a difference. He says, have compassion on them. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, pull them out of the fire. Carefully, he says, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So, the first thing was to believe in God. Second was to pray, or is to pray. The third, grow in the word of God. James chapter 1, verse 21. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness. Receive with meekness. What does it mean to be meek? Don't debate. It means don't argue with the word of God. He says, receive the engrafted word with meekness, which is able to save your soul. He says, it's able to change your person. You know one thing that any honest person will tell you? You can't really change people. The only way you can affect a person for real is through the word of God. He says the word of God is able to save your soul. The soul is the character of a person. The actual character. He say a wicked soul. Oh, she has a beautiful soul. A generous soul. So English language sometimes reveals what these things really are. Now, it says only the word of God, the engrafted word, is able, is able, has the ability to save your soul. It's why it's important to bring up children with the word of God. Because when they learn, a child that has been brought up with the word of God can, can be worked on. He, has in, he can be changed. He can be influenced. He can be helped. If not, the world will harden his heart. And then you can't help him. Then you can't help him. It says, receive the word of God, which is able to save your soul. It says, and be a doer of the word, and not a hearer only, deceiving yourself. For if any is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, you know this scripture, beholding his natural face in a glass, and forgets himself. What he's telling you is, look into the word of God, because it will show you who you truly are in the mirror of the word. And as you look at that image, you will become it. The less you look, the less you become like it. You start to forget it because you're not seeing it in front of you all the time. Meaning you become what you look at. So you save your friends. How are you going to do this? Through the scriptures. Right? But I said grow in the word of God. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. Paul tells us, he admonishes us to the word of God. To the word of his grace. He says, which is able to deliver unto us our inheritance. So there's a life for us, but he says the word of God will reveal it. So grow in the knowledge of the word of God. It'll help you. It'll help your character. It'll help your soul. Number four, again with prayer. Pray more and more. I read there Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Ephesians 5 18 tells us, Be not drunken with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And you know, I was trying to understand what is the beef with wine and the Spirit. Then I found out that both of them lead to two very opposite character traits. The spirit teaches you discipline. The spirit teaches you restraint. The spirit teaches you to hold in yourself and hold in your desires. But the, the wine teaches you, be expressive, engage in anything. Anything that you need to come out of your senses to do is probably not good for you. That's just the truth. So he says, be not drunken. Don't be overtaken with wine. But be filled with the Spirit instead. Wine is like saying, put apart your, your morality. Everything you know is right. Acts 4.31 says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. See, So the Spirit encourages you to speak the word of God. He helps you. With that, with boldness. But when there's wine, you speak anyhow. You abuse anyhow. You see. So he encourages, they encourage two different lifestyles. Two different lifestyles. So 
That prayer gives you the boldness to live for him and to do his will. And number five, to see him, to see the glory of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. So this is a subtopic under this main topic I'm talking about. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He says, henceforth is laid up for me. This is before Paul ever sees Jesus, apart from when he was called. But from here, he is sure. I told you that there is, there is a reward for believing. I don't know what your, your, your grip onto Jesus Christ is, but that's mine. Lord, I know that I will see you. And there's a reward for believing. So he says, I have kept the faith. I have held on to faith, even when it didn't make sense. He says, henceforth, imagine he's declaring from earth, henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He says, every person that's looking towards seeing Jesus, he says, he's going to give that crown of righteousness. You see? That's why in exactly why I'm awake. You see, we have, we have a song. You have a song that talks about Paul. I think Paul has a lot of fans down here, you know, because he's talked about Paul, talks about uh, writing letters. You can call me Paul, right? And I have one where I said, I, I want to say it exactly how it is, but it, it talks about, it, I'm expecting a crown. My life stays inspired by Paul. Crown of God, crown from God, me life stay inspired by Paul. That's what I'm expecting, a crown from God. A crown from God. A crown from God. So he says, expect him. And you're expecting that crown of righteousness. Okay? I have here, I encourage us all to watch the foundation school. Because you need to know that. So we've been on this subject of high-level prayers, high-level answers. You know? And that was a slight subtopic under that. The key verse we talked about was in Isaiah. That they that wait on the Lord, those who are bound together with the Lord, shall renew, shall change their strength. They'll grow up into a new strength. They'll change into a new strength. They'll sprout again. That's another one. They'll sprout again. They'll sprout again. So a person's life could be hopeless, but if they would discover, have you seen people that once they discovered Christ, there was joy in their lives again? And that's why you can never convince those people out of faith. They say, I know what my life was like. I know how I used to think. I know how pessimistic. But Christ gave me hope. There are some comment sections. You need to just go and, you know, I love comment sections that are filled with testimonies because you really see people's stories, you know, what they went through before they discovered Christ. I know particularly under Waymaker by Sinaj, there are a lot of testimonies. Even, and then Phil Wickham, there are a lot of testimonies in his comment section. Any Phil, any of his songs, you know, if anything, that's the kind of reaction I covet to have, you know? Where your song just gives people that sense of, they just want to testify. High level praying. So, I've been saying, God wants a spiritual people. First Peter 2 verse 9. He wants a spiritual people. We'll come to the end of this. He wants a spiritual people. This means people that operate from the realm of the spirit. They are conscious of the spiritual realm and its implications. And its implications. He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You are a peculiar people. That means not just you are a peculiar person. There's a reason he uses peculiar people. Because he's talking about the class of people that you are. Of course, you are peculiar like you are special. But he's saying, you people that I have called out as my children, you are a peculiar people. Meaning we have our own culture, our own way of life. He says, so that you will show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. So a chosen generation, you are separated. A royal priesthood, a priesthood. I told you, a priest is somebody, is a spiritual person. And particularly, he understands the importance of sacrifice. Right? To God, service to God. That's his area. That's the area of a priest. 
So God wants a spiritual people. He doesn't want us carnal, fleshly. We only operate by the senses. We only operate by what we see. He wants us to have a greater consciousness, a greater way of operating. Okay? So here, I have examples of weak type of praying because I said high level kind of prayer, right? Weak type of praying. Oh God, make a way for us. Oh God, make a way for us. Make a way. 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 Make a way for us, Lord. You know? Instead, you, you wake up to realize the role of the Spirit. The first bigger revelation is that you are the way. If you read in the book of Acts, you'd see that they called people that were of the church. They called them the circumcision. And it says people that were the way. They were of the way. Because Jesus was the way. So we are of the way. We are people of the way. When you come into Christ, you're baptized into him. You become the way. I know it sounds like heresy. But you become the way because you are one with the way. In other words, you become people's link and access to understanding God. It's a huge subject, but you become that link. What is the way? The way to, Jesus said, I'm going to the Father. And Philip asked, with which route? How are you planning on getting there? He said, Philip, you already know the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. Okay? When you become one with Jesus Christ, you become that way that people can get to know the Father. That's why Paul talks about in the New Testament, he says, as ambassadors of Christ, meaning we represent that agency. We represent the kingdom of God. We become that way. All right? So instead of make a way for us, make a way, depending on the situation, he says, ask and it shall be given. Lord, what is the way? Show me the way. And you're open now to the visions of the Spirit. That's how the Spirit of God cannot talk to you. Oh, go this way, go this way. When you say make a way, make a way, you're betting on the invisible. Like, make a way is like, you're just expecting, like, you know, but Lord, show me the way. How, how, can, how can I go? What's the way forward? And he will show you. He will show you. He will open up your mind. Not, Lord, I'm broke. Lord, I'm broke. He knows. <laughs> he knows. Lord, where is my money? What should I use? What should I focus on? What is the focus area? Then you can draw your mind to that. He's been with you since. He knows. He's very aware. He's very aware your card bounced yesterday. He knows. He knows. Hmm? See? So you pray high level prayers. You pray, pray. High level prayers are prayers that take advantage of your relationship with Christ. That's what high level prayers are. When I say high level prayer, high level answer, I'm saying, Pray prayers that take advantage of what Christ died for and was raised for. Don't pray like somebody that is away from Christ. Oh Lord, save me, save me, save me. You're the saved, meant to be saving others. Pray prayers that take advantage of Christ. Thank you. Christ is my advantage. I'm convinced I can, I, uh, God can't leave me in this life. I'm convinced. It's my conviction. God won't leave me. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say. Let's, let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to see the kind of mentality he wants us to have. Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 5, he says, let your conversation. Now, this word conversation does not mean your discussion. It actually means your manner of life, the way you go about life. Check the original. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. He says, See, so these are one of the signs that you are praying low-level prayers. There's covetousness in your prayers. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Don't be always wanting what another person has. You feel like you don't have. He says, and be content with the things that you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So a low-level prayer is, Lord, don't leave me. Lord, Lord, don't forsake me. Lord, if you remember me. Lord, no. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How can God tell you I will never leave you nor forsake you? If you can't believe God, who would you now believe? He says, 
I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. That's an example of a higher level prayer. The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That, that is a different kind of authority. High level prayers have authority with them. They have an understanding with them. The Lord is my helper. There's no longer, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, save me, Lord, provide for me, Lord, Lord, take control, Lord, mm -mm. Lord, you are in control, ruler of the universe, you are in control of my life. My life is in your hands. Thank you because I don't fail. Thank you because you are in control. You, Lord, you are my vision. What I say, Lord, you are my future. Lord, you are my future, meaning I'm walking into you. You, 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 know, you know what I mean to say God is your future? Like, Lord, you are my inheritance. You are the good, the good that, Lord, you are the good that is coming to me. I'm convinced. It's not, Lord, I hope my future is bright. Please let it be bright. I'm, I'm expecting a flash through my, you know, through my room that's going to convince me. of No. Lord, you are the light of my life. Like David said, Lord, you're the strength of my life. You're the strength of my life. You're the strength of my life. Another thing, meditation I have here. Meditation is also higher level. Is a higher level of prayer. Meditation. Joshua 1 verse 8. Instead of praying, Oh Lord, prosper me. When you meditate, you come to Nehemiah's conviction. Nehemiah said, My God shall prosper me. My God shall prosper me. My, I like it. My God shall prosper me. No, he's sure. He's, <laughs> my God. <laughs> my God shall prosper me. Joshua 1 8. He says, Meditate. He says, talk the scriptures. Talk it. He says, through talking the scriptures, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. So instead of praying to God for success, you spend more time meditating on his scriptures. David said, my, my enemies encompassed me all about, but thy mitzvah was my meditation. He said, I saw the end of all human uh, perfection. I saw the greatest uh, chariots and everything. But he says, your, your mitzvah has no bounds. Your word, mitzvah means your word. So he said he was encompassed with enemies. But he says, your word was my, your testimonies. That's what he says precisely. Your testimonies were my contemplation. He says, I saw through human beings the end of perfection. I knew what man could get me. But he says, your word is boundless. It has no, no, no limitation. So David learned to meditate. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That, that was how David was. He was conscious, meditating on the word like that. Meditating on the word. So I said meditation is a higher level. It's a higher level. Psalm 119. Isn't it so blessed when we just have the Psalms in, in service? Psalm 119. And I'm reading from 130. Verse 130 says, the entrance of thy word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. So this same Joshua who learned from God that meditation was a high level of prayer to make his way successful and prosperous, was this same Joshua that learned that was regarded as the only man that God listened to in the way that God listened to him. He said, son, stand still. You want to see it? Joshua chapter 10. He says, since that day, God has not listened to a man the way he listened to Joshua. Let me show you. Joshua chapter 10, from verse 12. He says, then spake Joshua to the Lord. Every time you read in the Bible, it's usually pray, he prayed. But then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of all Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. I want you to understand, God said in Genesis, light be, because he had created that light. How can a creation tell you how to operate your own creation? Did Joshua make the sun, moon, and stars? But he said, Son, stand still this way, moon in the valley of this. Verse 13, and the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Joshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not. It didn't rush to go down about the whole, a whole day. 
And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. High level prayers. High level results. Answers. Answers. So what is God? Please help me. Help me, help me, help me. You take action. You take action. We're almost done. Almost done. You take action. In Second Chronicles 20, 1 to 3, it says, My eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. High-level praying takes advantage of principles rather than begging for results. That's something to note. High-level praying takes advantage of principles, meaning how did God say this result will be achieved? You take advantage of that rather than begging for a result. Rather than begging for a result. See? James 5.16, it says, praying with power. Praying with power. That's, that talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person makes tremendous power available, dynamic in his working. So, he says, there's power in prayer. You learn to pray with power to have results. So, you say, Lord, you are my help. You are my help. You are my help. See, with that, you are dependent. You are full of God. There's assurance in the scripture. There's a sure result. There's less heartache and worry. You know, it, there are some prayers. It's easier to worry with them than others. You can't be worrying if you're saying, Lord, you're my help. When you say, Lord, help me, then the tears can easily flow. You see, everything. And you think God is moved by the tears. Find out how Jesus treated the woman who was begging about her sick daughter. She cried and cried and Jesus just kept walking. She was crying and crying and crying and crying. So God isn't moved by your tears. But then the woman said something. You see? He said that even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Because Jesus wasn't sent onto her, so he didn't give her attention. I think she was a Samaritan. But the moment she was able to bring out scripturally where she could get a blessing, the Bible says that he turned and rewarded her faith. God is very interesting. But this is what I mean by principles. These are things that you can study. And I've also made references to these in past messages. You know, So you work more with the scriptures. All right. So three things that make your prayers higher level. Number one, scripture as the basis. When scriptures are the foundation of your prayer, it's higher level. It's higher level praying. Number two, time in the presence of God. There are things that make your prayers higher level. Then three, confessions. And prophecy. Number one, scriptures are the basis when it comes to high level praying. Number two, time in the presence of God. And number three, high confessions or big confessions. By I said confessions the first time. Confessions and prophecy. It's not complete until you declare what you want, what the result will be. Say in the name of Jesus. Health is restored. Health is restored. So you stop crying, you stop begging, you stop worrying and aching. But you make higher level prayers. I decree and declare my day is blessed. My future is secure. I'm learning. I'm gaining opportunities like never before. I am forward ever. I'm forever favored. Nothing can stop me. My aeon is one of prosperity and consistent progress. I'm forever ahead. I'm forever flying. Greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world. Nothing can dim my confidence. These are the things that inspire your faith and the spirit of God inside of you. As you start like that, there's an infilling of the spirit going on. And when you're filled with the spirit and power, anything can happen. You read of Elijah. See? He knew not to be like Moses who cried before the Jordan, before the river. Elijah went straight and divided it without even thinking. You see? He put forth his mantle and parted the waters. But Moses cried first. See? And I would not be shocked, you know, if Daniel had read about Jeremiah to know that Israel was going to be free, I wouldn't be shocked if Elijah had read about Moses who cried before the Red Sea. See? And so he knew. 
to split it with his mantle. The point is don't repeat the weaknesses of the past. I don't know if you guys understand what I just said. Important stuff. Okay. So authority commands results. I'm just helping summarize all of this. All of this. So you have more thankfulness. More thankfulness. So have we understood this concept of high level prayers? More authority, scriptural basis, you know, and you'd be provoked by the things that people in the scriptures did and said to have greater results. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for this series. Thank you for all we've been able to learn. Thank you because we'll make more effectual prayers. When we pray, we are heard of you. And that assurance assures us that everything that we've asked, everything that we thank you for, we have. Thank you because the prayers we've been praying are coming to pass. Everything we've asked for, everything we've needed of you, thank you because we are conscious you are our supply, our provision, our provision. And we'll continue to enjoy the benefits of being in Christ. Thank you because our faith stands strong. Our faith stands strong. We are unshaken no matter the influences, the corrupting influences of this world. Our light continues to shine. And the fruits of our belief in you are coming out for the world to see and to glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right then. So do feel free to give an offering to the Lord and pray over it. Thank you for the opportunity to give an offering. The details are as conventional through the group chat and everything. So with that said, I'll be saying bye-bye to the people on this side of the screen. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you learned something through the series and we're looking forward to seeing you in the next sermon series that we have. God bless you.